What's up to all my philosophy lovers out there? It's your boy Ian here today to break down Bertrand Russell's A History of Western Philosophy. And if you guys would like to see more books about philosophy, psychology, literature, and other social sciences and humanities, subscribe to the channel, everybody. I am trying to become the best booktuber in the world and change the world through books. But first, we have to talk about Bertrand Russell, the logical positivist, the boogeyman of early the American analytics in West early 20th century American philosophy and this book is really good and when I read a historical book on Western on philosophy or psychoanalysis most of the time I want it to be biased I don't want to read the Cambridge history of Western philosophy I want the biased reasoning I want Bertrand Russell one of the most impactful American philosophers maybe not in maybe not in the top 10 but at, at a time, and for all the pseudo-hipsters out there who like to read uh, Bertrand Russell's critiques of Christianity, for all of them, he's a big figure. And he drops bombs in this text, biased bombs, and that's what we want. And I'm going to talk about some of the ones I think that, that fall flat on their faces and some that I think are really good. So I would recommend, though, if you have never read a history of Western philosophy, that you start with Will Durant's The Story of Philosophy. This book is a lot better, a lot better. Will Durant is a beautiful writer. I think one of the best writers of the 20th century across all genres. And he really, he covers fewer people. He covers, I think, eight or nine philosophers. And it's a little bit shorter and a little bit easier. But Tran Russell, though, gives a very historical breakdown. And one of the shining moments of this text is at the very start. And he breaks down all the Greeks, the pre-Socratics, and of course, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, and then the philosophers coming after them, and then, of course, the Dark Ages. And I think that Bertrand really shines here because a lot of people, especially if you're going to be reading a history of Western philosophy, most of, the, most of the time, like I said, two things are happening. You want to know Bertrand Russell's thoughts on all these philosophers, and he'll give them to you. He'll give you his biased opinion. And then, and then that's the funny thing about this text is this text starts to go on uh, as we start hitting the middle to the end, starts turning more into what Russell thinks instead of what these philosophers think and almost to the point of like this should just be one of his books uh but at the start he really keeps it calm especially through the Greeks and then the Catholic philosophers because if you are a philosopher you are a fan of philosophy you will find that there is a gold mine in the Greeks and then of course in the Catholic philosophers Augustine and Aquinas and that whole crew I think that Russell really captures the Greeks very well because at some level, all, he has everything to give to Plato and Aristotle. Plato and Aristotle, and he drops a bomb though that really blew my mind when I was reading it. And I kind of passed by it the first time I, I read it, but then I just reread this for this review. And he said that the he questioned Socrates' existence, and you know Jesus's existence, Shakespeare's existence. We contemplate that. We, you know, intell us intellectuals, we like to argue about that. But I've never heard anyone question Socrates' existence. I remember one time I was in this philosophy class and very, I'm just going to tell the story. She was very good looking, right? And like all the guys like on the first, like in the first week were just goo goo eyes about it, right? And then we were reading, it was like an ancient Greek philosophy class. And then she raises her hand, right? Like on the first day we're actually talking in like the second week. And she's, she starts talking about Socrates. And I'm like, who the fuck is Socrates? I'm thinking she's like talking about some priests and she's talking about Socrates. And then I realized slowly among everyone else that she's talking about Socrates. And anyway, that's just a quick side. Funny story about that. Another time at one in the morning at a park in Las Vegas, right? And that girl ended up, I feel like, felt like liking me, but I was way too stoned to even notice or care. And at 1 a.m. at a park in Las Vegas one time, I was doing calisthenics. This is a crazy Ian. I'm doing calisthenics and ring workout on the bars. And I see this girl on a bench reading a book. And then I'm walking by her to go back to my car. And I see it's her. And I'm like, yo, what's up? What are you reading? And she's reading an Einstein book, Einstein's book, trying to prove the theory of God. And I'm like, and I'm like, why are you reading that? And in my head, I was thinking like, you're not smart enough to read that. You called him Socrates Socrates and many other things throughout the semester. And then she said, yeah, anyway, anyway, that was just a synchronicity. But Socrates, Socrates, as I'm going to call him right now, his existence is questioned by Bertrand Russell. And he says, what do you think the reasoning is? Oh, there's no, hoods. yeah, there's really not that much historical evidence for him. You know, it's a little bit far back. The only historical evidence that we have really is that Plato said that Socrates, Socrates existed. And 
Socrates, Socrates, excuse me. Russell says that the only reason, the Plato is the only storyteller in the world that can make us believe that Socrates existed. I don't know if they said that right, but Plato is such a good writer that he could actually make us believe that this guy who never existed, existed. And if you think about it, if you are going to start a movement, if you want to be remembered, you have to have a storyline. What is Plato without the story of Socrates and all those different, you know, all the stories, all of his dialogues, a lot of Plato's dialogues are based off of Socrates and you need a character. You need someone to rumble with in your dialects. If you think about it, it's actually really smart. You always need an adversary. The biggest selling fights in the UFC or whatever, you need another person. Sugar Ray Leonard in the 1990s was one of the best boxers in the world, but no one remembers him because he just was way too good and he never had an adversary. You always need an adversary to, you know, create numbers, to create people to care. And even though he's not an adversary, he was... Socrates was an adversary of the sophists and Plato was thus taking the torch and fighting not just against the sophists but against the people that killed Socrates. His mentor got killed. What's a better storyline as a philosopher rising up out of the ashes other than your mentor got killed? That's like some movie shit, man. It's so great. I mean, but Tran Russell come out here throwing the shots and like I said, we really can't prove that just like how we can't prove the historicity really of Jesus. And I know all my Christians out there are going to go crazy over that, but we really can't because the first non-Christian source to talk about Jesus talked about Jesus 128 years after the fact, if I have that correct. So really Socrates, that really blew my mind. I've never heard of that before, that calling Socrates into a, a question. But if you really think about the logical positivists, which really in a short summary is that truth doesn't exist, that really objective truth doesn't exist. And that's what Bertrand Russell and the analytic American thought philosophers were trying to you know, shoot down in their own personal way. If you, if you think about it, Aristotle and thus Plato and thus Socrates are a big part of that feeling, the, the connection, the Rene Descartes separation, you know, between man and nature it really starts with the categorization and the taxonomies in nature done by Aristotle, thus influenced by Plato's forms. And we don't have a very Heraclitian society. We don't really appreciate nature like Heraclitus does. I think Bertrand Russell has a very beautiful section on Heraclitus, and he actually gives respect. You know, a lot of these Greek philosophers, when you look at their philosophy, they're kind of whack, right? Like, I don't want to say they're whack, but like, oh, it's all the elements, you know? They don't, their ideas don't really hold up, but they're like the, the ideas of elementary schoolers or middle schoolers of today if they had to philosophize or think about the world and never knew science. But Bertrand Russell really gives them a lot of credit for what they thought and their linear thinking. I really like that. Unlike Will Durant, that Russell shows the evolution of thought, of Western thought. And I think he does that in Mark across the whole book, even with his transgressions and his self-promotion, he still shows that line of thinking and gives respect to the people for what they did at the time. Cause what these guys were doing, these Greek philosophers at the time was magical. It, we don't really get to experience that magic anymore with all these nuanced wars and PhDs and all the illiterate masses. We don't get to see these big breakthroughs because no one cares anymore. No one reads the journal, philosophical journals anymore. We think Slavoj Žižek is the best philosopher of all time because once again, he's the guy on the board. He's the A side of the card. He, how did Jordan Peterson and Žižek get bigger? They had, there's an adversary, right? That's how they got their name out there even more, but we don't see these debates uh, we don't see philosopher debates other than if they're polarizing figures like those two in the public eye anymore because to become a great philosopher now, you have to be deeper than Kant. You have to know all of Kant and then take it to the next level. And to take things to the next level during the 21st century, it's almost like becoming a crazy computer engine uh, programming or, or engineer. You kind of get a little detached. And in that detachment, you can't become a sociable person. That's where I think Betran Russell really shines. And he's like, well, of, of that last generation with, with George Santian, Santiana, I'm saying that wrong, I'm sorry, who really had a personality, who had some force, who could really come out as philosophers and walk the walk and be like making big progress, you know, making substantial claims and being the top of their field and being a public figure. Like I said, I, I'm challenging you right now. Tell me someone that is at the top of their field and a huge public figure right now in terms of philosophy. Like a lot of these guys are, if we're, you know, going through, you know, Locke and Hume and Rousseau and Kant and Hegel and Schopenhauer, you, now maybe not Marx, but, and Dewey, all these people at their time were big deals. Maybe not all of them, but you guys get what I'm saying here. So Russell is a really cool figure for that. And I think that's why his ego and his personality comes out now. And I, yeah, I think it's really awesome. So if we move on from the Greeks, which I think that 
Russell makes a, once again a very good stab at. I think that very well worth reading. I learned a lot. A lot of these people I will you know haven't read before, even though I considered myself I've read the complete works of Plato, read a lot of Aristotle, considered myself pretty well versed, taking some uh, philosophy classes. I didn't know you know there were you know five or six people in here I knew about but didn't really get the whole history on, and I gained a new perspective on some people also like Heraclitus who I really admire because if you look at the story of philosophy right here he has this really cool section of the table of philosophical affiliations and kind of the lines of thinking and if you look at heraclitus up at the top it got it kind of just jumping it goes heraclitus marcus aurelius spinoza schelling schopenhauer nietzsche and then nietzsche if you want the path to nietzsche you have to go through kind of hegel schopenhauer schelling spinoza you know it's that it's that idealism mind, you know, for everyone who's reading, who's read it, I'm assuming you know what I'm talking about, that God, that God maybe isn't singular, that it's multi, God maybe can be multifaceted and of many consciousnesses or just isn't this one thing. And that's coming from Heraclitus's more subjective view of nature. But if we look at, oh, I lost the page. Oh, no, I didn't. If we look at Russell, Russell, we, we um, or like, for instance, the sophist, you know, inspired Socrates, which inspired Plato and Aristotle, then Aquinas, then Bacon, then... Kant, and then you know going down to James and Dewey these associations are really cool and and Russell and the, I once again it gives me some different perspectives and when you start to understand and connect the philosophical affiliations that's what's really good about these books that are you going to read a, about Heraclitus or about all these guys that are talked about especially at the start of this text probably not you're probably not going to just judging on your life unless you're really into philosophy but and I guess I should have said this a minute number one but if you Philosophy is hard. Philosophy isn't a walk in the park like pop psychology or even pop philosophy. If you once you start diving into real philosophical or psychoanalytical thought, it's hard because a lot of it actually builds off of the start. It builds off of the Greeks. If you don't understand the Greeks and you can't really understand the Catholic philosophers, then you can't. And then in today, if you think about it, like if you read Derrida or Foucault, they're always talking about Plato. Plato's still coming up. And if you read Heidegger, it's like a response to Plato and to the idealism and all these different people so it, it never ends and you, to really dive into it you don't really know where to start and starting at the start with the greeks can be really hard and working your way all the way through it so philosophy can be hard but something that you can do is that you can get inspired you can learn the stories that you love and become inspired that's what i did first with um these two books especially with the story of philosophy i read all the authors at least a couple of their works that i learned about in that in the in that book because all of them have a great personal story also that Will Durant tells well. So anyway, yeah. So then if we move on to the Catholic philosophers, more, you know, mid, mid middle of the philosophical round, medieval philosophers and earlier than that, Aquinas, Augustine. Surprisingly, once again, I read this book a couple years ago. I feel way more versed in philosophy now. Russell, I, when, you know, you read Russell, you know, knowing Russell, you expect him to attack them. You expect him to attack these Christian philosophers, but he does it because they take it to the next level. They are monks. They are in the game. They are doing the, the hard work of taking and remixing Plato and the Greeks because nobody did it. Nobody for hundreds of years took it all to the next level. You can't start from nothing. That's what people don't realize, that you can't start from nothing, that you have to start and stand. You have to climb up the mountain, then stand on the shoulders of the greats, and then, you know, be the next pillar in the in the chain of thought if you want you know to be great or to understand what is going on and that's what russell really does because he gives praise and that's something that we a lot of people in philosophy now suck at. if you're listening to that right now you have to give praise you have to be positive about all philosophers all writers all people even if you disagree with them even if you think they're a jerk or crazy or a jerk you have to or they're elitist you have to give them like if you hate communists and you can't give praise to Karl Marx, then you're just not a deep thinker because you don't realize that that had to happen. Communism and Marxism had to happen. Maybe not in the way that happened, but the philosophy had to manifest from the path and trajectory that, excuse me, philosophy got started on. These things, once you understand, it's all just cause and effect at some level, and you can't be angry about it because if you're angry about it, you don't understand the power of it. If you can't sit and understand Marx, you can't understand the last 70 years of philosophy. You're going to be stuck back with Russell. You're not going to understand the postmodernists and all the crazy stuff happening in philosophy now, even if you think it's all just a bunch of crazy leftists, and it is. But back in the day, some of these people are a bunch of crazy people, crazy um, elitists. Like, you have to separate yourself from the fact in philosophy, and a lot of people love to get in these 
these wars. I, you know, I've spent so much time in university and people are like, oh, you like him? I'm like, dude, I like everybody, man. And that's what these books are so important for, man, is that it shows you what, why it matters. What the, it brings the human element back. It hopefully can separate you through the story because that's what matters. It's the story of philosophy. His story Bertrand's story of Western philosophy, and they are trying to make you see. They're trying to open up the flower and help you bloom into the philosophical mind. And if you're 17 minutes into this video and still listening, then that means that you probably already have done that. So Russell accolades to him for giving praise to the to the Catholic philosophers, giving them the justice that they deserve. I can guarantee you that he if you haven't read it yet. Go check it out. I mean, and he shows you why Aquinas and Augustine and those guys and, and that whole camp are. I, I once again very important you can't yeah you you can't be where we're at now really i mean i guess you could but without what they did can, can you have the renaissance can you have the enlightenment period can you have francis bacon probably not and without francis bacon none of that happens so yeah our boy francis my mr bacon Bertrand doesn't really give i would you know the story of philosophy so reading this compared to the story of philosophy the philosophers that he covers fall a lot shorter that Bertrand gives a very clear he likes to give a clear history he doesn't like to tell the story you don't really know if you read the story philosophy section on Francis Bacon because he's a really interesting figure some of these philosophers are actually really interesting I think that's a part of the history like I said that it makes you care it makes you really care when they're interesting so moving on a little bit further he does a very big analysis of Hume and Locke and pull it up and you can kind of see his biases starting to come out in the modern philosophy section. I'm looking right now and you start to see like Francis Bacon gets five pages. Spinoza gets nine pages, but Hume gets 17 pages. And you start to see it's like, really, is he really that? But you think about it. Oh, he, Hume's very important. I'm sorry if I mispronounce any of these. Very important for Bertrand Russell's thought patterns and his where he's going with his philosophy. You need that. So that's what he really focuses on. Like he doesn't even mention Schelling, who I think is very important for Nietzsche. He does it. He barely, I mean, he does a slight analysis, six pages on Schopenhauer. So in this final section, and now I think it's now time to, I, I think he does a great job. I think he does a really great job. He shows the, he shows the whole history. He brings in a lot of people that most history of philosophy books don't bring in. He summarizes their thoughts very well, but it's kind of a travesty. And this is kind of, he's writing in the, in the World War II period of, while well, he's writing this during World War II. And, you know, there's, of course, a very negative view of Nietzsche. Until the 50s and 60s with an author, a famous philosopher, writing, writer, I can't remember right now, Nietzsche had a dark stain that nobody really understood and brought his actual work to light and all the opinions were generally negative. And I would agree here. And you would think that anyone that actually just read the work would understand. But the will to power when you have a bunch of Nazis killing tens of millions, well, yeah, tens of millions of people, I guess, in total across, you know, like, you know, tens of million people die in a war that they start, is a lot, right? And with fascism in general everywhere and then communism sparking up and powerful dictators and stuff, you know, I understand why it's not very good. But at some level, for us to, where we are going as human beings now with this infinite potential in this mostly free world, this mostly pretty chill world until the recent, you know, war happening, we can learn a lot through Nietzsche for personal development, for our own life, about the way the technology and technology's position, which is very, Superman like very ubermanch like and we need to understand that and come to terms with that before we start going into AI land But no one seems to care nobody seems to care and want to understand a lot of these concepts Which are now so important that the real thing that we're going to need moving forward And I think you know obviously Russell doesn't understand this is that we need a big set of ethics If we're going to start making robots if there are going to be weapons and robots that can kill people and go crazy. We need to have very good ethics for the people controlling them or for even the robots or AI itself. We need to be able to understand that and reason with it and understand what we are making. And it doesn't seem like we are doing that. It seems like we are just heading straight into the void, having this Machiavellian point of view toward the earth. There's a uh, this Descartes. And that's it kind of all stems from this Cartesian split from nature that we still haven't mended yet that in the poetic world and in parts of literature we've mended that but in actual our actual consciousness we are still fragmented we are still fragmented traumatized human beings engaging in abuse and so if you guys enjoyed this review leave a like subscribe to the channel and then go check out my video on a little book on the human shadow by robert bly it will delve into some of the problems that humans